Greetings and welcome to Outlaws to the End. This is the official It's Sometimes podcast of the Outlaw Gamer Society, and I am your host, Brent Adams, joined as always by the man on the horse beside me, Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren. Lauren. Oh, <laughs> I was waiting. You had this, you had, where's the throw to me? That's it's your a, cue. That's the it's throw. Been, it's been a while. It's, it has we're, we're, been. we're rusty. Just yeah, we're something. But not, uh, you know what? I'm not. We're, we're not. I'm not rusty. It's like riding a bike, Brent. It's so good to be back here with you. I know it's been a while. It has been. Well, you know, we, we had that utter fail attempt at retirement, where we 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 retired and then put out three shows in three weeks, and uh, and and then we stopped sucking at retirement and we didn't put out any shows. And now, that's right. And now we're back to sucking at retirement again. That's right. But like we said, you know, we we kind of we said we were going to do shows sort of when we felt like it, but it's not at this point now. That would be. Four shows in about as many months. It just so happened that the first three came one right after the other. <laughs> That's true. That's right. Um, and the reason we're here doing this for you right now is because we wanted to get it done before Uncharted Four comes out next week. That's true. Which I'm pretty confident we will be doing a post mortem for. Yeah, we we will be, and we won't have time to do this show uh, next week because we will be playing Uncharted Four. That's exactly for right. the post mortem as well as for glory. <laughs> for um, the glory of Valhalla, and then after that, Brent, E3. we haven't talked about. It. We talked about it just a little bit, but I'm guessing we will do something about E3. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very surprised if we didn't do some E3 coverage, especially considering the fact that there are so many interesting <laughs> things that we're probably going to see at this year's uh, E3. Don't do it. Don't don't um, tease me. Don't tease me. Rumors are rumors are that uh. Red Dead Two, and of course, you know, I'd I'd still be happy with like a you know just a version of Red Dead for. You know, like a remaster for the current gen consoles, or the PC or even the better, PC, so you PC know you can have it forever. Better. The PC yes. would be even better. Um, but uh, anyway, there's lots and lots of stuff to uh, that, that we that we could be talking about. But um, I guess w- what we're really here to talk about is sort of what we've been playing. And for me, that's Tom Clancy's The Division, and for Lauren, that's VR, that's Oculus Rift stuff. Yep. So this is going to be kind of a what we're playing show, and it'll kind of you know divide along those lines. So, Lauren, you want to start with the division? Does that sound uh, good to you? Yeah, let's. I'm because I'm really curious, and you, we we actually talked about we we were considering talking about this a, a little while ago, and we, we decided to hold off until I got the riff so we could sort of do them together. But uh, yes, I've really been curious. I, I looked today at the website, and I believe it was Outlaw Gamers Play the Division number 44. Yeah, today was 44. Um, we've been, um, I mean, we've been playing this game almost every every day for the last, for the last, uh, let's see, when, it, when did it come out? Uh, back on like the 8th of March, so it's been right. just about two months now. Yeah, so... I mean, I heard the game is not very good. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Yeah, I'm totally <laughs> well, I mean, kidding. honestly, I mean, it depends on what yardstick you use, but if technical soundness is the measure by, <laughs> by which you're going to mark, it ain't that good. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I have all, all sorts of questions, man. Because So I watched you do one of the streams I watched, and I hopped on and chatted with you guys a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was very close to getting the game, even though, because I'm a sucker that way. But I, I honestly, and this was this was probably, I don't know, maybe I don't even remember, but but it was fairly early, like maybe two or three weeks in. Yeah. Um. And and a big reason I didn't buy the game, honestly, is because I thought I don't think they're going to be playing very long. Like you had already been playing it long enough that that you were into it and you understood it. Yeah. And I I just was afraid that I was going to buy it and you guys wouldn't play it, and and of course I was wrong. So mm-hmm. so tell me first of all, I'm curious. Like I, I've read a lot of stuff about. Issues with the game, which I'm sure you'll talk about in terms of uh, loot or level balancing oh, or hacks. And, um, but first and foremost, what is it that's kept you playing for two months? So I think it's a combination of, of who I'm playing with, uh, which you know typically uh, I play with uh, Christoph Fatui, Krister Lindquist, and then, uh, and then Lance Latham. And... We've also played quite a bit with uh, with Ian, who is Alexander Arts on the site. Yep. Uh, although actually, we haven't we haven't heard from Ian uh, in a, in a couple of weeks. Actually, hopefully hopefully he's doing okay. Um, but we we played quite a, quite a bit with Ian, and we've also played uh, recently with uh, with Neil and uh, and Alexis a little bit as well. But um, and then, and like Neil, he's played quite a bit with uh, with Alexis and uh, Randy Marshbeer and, and Ian. You know, so there's. There's there's a few people that are all you know that have all kind of played the game, but um, but anyway that core group, 
I don't know. Like we've we've ju- we're just into it enough, and the thing that the thing about the game that's kind of interesting is that there is there's certainly problems. We can talk about specifics. There are certainly problems with the game, but there are also things about the game that are really really fun. And at its core, the combination of the the kind of um, light lightly tactical cover based shooter in conjunction with the um, the sort of loot and shoot kind of MMO mechanics is a good combination. And when the game is working and when you're doing that stuff and you're leveling your gear and, you know, you're, you're increasing, you know, your character stats and all that stuff and, you know, working your way towards that next sort of milestone, it's a lot of fun. But, uh, but there are some road, some road bumps along the way. You know, one of the things I'm curious about you talked about the you know the the leveling the RPG the loot mechanics and stuff and one of the things that I felt in the couple times that I had played it, which was in the beta, mm-hmm. uh, so I only got to see one area, but also when I watched you guys play it a little bit, was it felt pretty very samey to me in terms of environment. And I'm curious when you actually play the game, if it feels that way or if or if the environment is interesting enough in itself, like it, it to keep you interested, or is it really more about the mechanics? It's more about the mechanics for me. I can't speak for anybody else, but. Um... Yeah, I think that, you know, the kind of the overworld, which is lower Manhattan, is... Um, no Brooklyn yet, right? Uh, not yet. I I, yeah. I think that might be later... That might be one of the expansions that's happening, you know, later in the summer. Okay. Uh, I can't remember for sure. But uh, in any case, uh, the game world as it exists right now, I mean, just, you know, running through endless streets covered in snow, trash, dead bodies, and abandoned cars, it does all... It does all tend to blend together. Now, having said that, once you start getting into the mission areas and some of the encounter areas and things like that, those levels or those parts of the world have been designed with, uh, you know, a bit more a bit more forethought, and uh, so those do tend to get interesting. And and you know, so like I think you and I played the mission, uh, you know, for like the Madison Square Madison Garden. Square Garden. Yep. Uh, we did that one and. I, that's pretty indicative. I mean, like, you know, once you go inside some of these places, once you go inside some of these environments, you know, it, it's, it's really a whole other thing. And so the, the game doesn't suffer from that too much because we don't tend to run the streets a lot. We tend to fast travel from where we are to the mission and then we're playing the mission and then we're fast traveling back. Me- meaning when you're playing the mission, you're indoors usually. Uh, it, no? it varies. I mean, some I missions gotcha. are indoors, some aren't. But you you're know? not just you're not just running the streets. No, no, not not typically. I, now we're talking. Are we talking about? So there's the there's the um and forget there's the dark zone. Yeah, the dark right? zone is uh, you, you know like that's like kind of in the middle of the map, like you saw on the beta, and, and that's the free like free area PvP where you can be killed and. Well, that's what's interesting about it. It's both PVE and PvP, and that's what kind of gives it that sort of psychological day Z kind of flavor. Right where you don't know what the other people are going to do. Like it, I, I did a guest spot on, uh, on uh, John Carter's uh, Hardly Casual podcast recently, and we were talking about that, and he was saying, couldn't they just like lose the NPCs and just have it be player versus player? And if they did that, it would just be basically like a big deathmatch sort of thing. But right. by having NPCs, and there are, there are landmarks inside there where you're going to find NPCs, you'll, you'll find NPCs at random on the streets, but they'll be higher level and tougher. There's a very good chance you're going to have a named boss who are like, you know, like the, the big elites uh, in the game. Uh, and of course, you want to go after them because in theory, they're going to have the best loot, except right. not. But in doing so, you're just giving away your position. <clears throat> exactly. And, but the, the point is that having other NPCs, having all those NPCs in there means that you have something to shoot at besides other players. And so you you are left with the choice of to as to whether or not you're going to shoot NPCs or shoot other players or both, and so just having that choice changes the entire dynamic of the dark zone in a really interesting way. Yeah. So when you say so, but when you and I remember playing the dark zone, and I really enjoyed that that component of it. We did it together, and mm-hmm. you're, that choice, you're right, is fundamentally what makes it I think interesting, or it would just be a giant death match. But um, when you say we go to our missions, we fast travel to our missions, do our missions, and go. Are, are you talking about outside of the dark zone, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. There's there's no missions as such in the dark zone. Uh, the dark zone is um, there's things to do there. I mean, like there are. I guess I guess there's sort of like sort of three fundamental things you can do. Number one, you can um, you can just sort of run around and you can just take down mobs. 
and, uh, and, and you know, they're, they're all over the map. Then there's also landmarks in the dark zone. Those are specific locations where you're uh, not always, I mean, because they will have to respawn. So it's possible you can run by one of these locations and it'll be empty because somebody's cleared it out and it hasn't reset. Right. But there are landmark locations in the dark zone uh, where you're going to find typically, you know, a, a pretty tough mob and uh and a named a mob boss. of npcs or of, 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 of npcs right yeah. uh and a named boss and then there are also uh loot chests in the dark zone that are you know just kind of spread throughout and so if you want to get loot then chances are you're going to be going for landmarks trying to take down named bosses and then also getting uh getting loot chests sometimes there are loot chests at uh these landmarks and sometimes that you know that they're kind of hidden in other places so, and then there's also, and then the other thing I would say as far as loot goes, because I mean, the Dark Zone's all about loot. Ubisoft has made it very clear that that's what the Dark Zone is for. The they, best loot. They expect... It's e- the most dangerous, and that's where the best loot is. Well, I mean, in theory. I mean, I mean, maybe when they fix the game, it'll have the best loot. But I mean, like, one of the chief complaints with the game is that the loot sucks. Uh, in general? You, you, can spend, you can spend eight hours, like, you know, in the Dark Zone, and for your trouble, you will get you know, some like gear mods and maybe like a few silencers or something. I mean, I mean like it really is that ridiculous. Um, specifically in the dark zone or, or throughout yes, the in, game? Well, throughout the game, but the dark zone specifically, I, I mean, there, there've been plenty of days that, um, there've been plenty of days that, you know, that we've been looting in the dark zone and, uh, and, and come away with basically nothing to show for it, but, but weapon mods, you know, maybe like, you know, pistols and shotguns, like right, just, just shitty stuff. Things. But anyway, the, the the only other thing I was going to add is that inside the dark zone, not not the checkpoints where you enter, there are vendors there. Like when you go into the dark zone, there's a there's an ammo crate and a vendor. But inside the dark zone, there are safe houses, and those safe houses have vendors, and you can buy you can you can buy relatively good gear from them. Ubisoft, you know, doesn't want you to. They want you to kill enemies and get the really good loot that way. So the loot you get at the vendors is not the best, but it's better than what you can get outside of the dark zone. So right. there's that sort of avenue of progression as well. But all That's, of this is all of this is kind of fucked. I, I mean, like as far as like complaints about the game and everything outside of the the glitching, the exploits, the bugs with the game, uh, and, and players taking advantage of that stuff or just outright cheating. Outside from all of that, the fundamental mechanical problem with the game is the loot progression, which is the heart and soul of this kind of game. Uh, the loot progression is fundamentally broken. So, uh, I'm curious how much time you spend in the dark zone based on everything you just said, but before you answer that, I want to know, again, I'm just, I mean, you're saying, aside from the bugs and the outright cheating, and the fact that the fundamental mechanic in the game is broken, yet you continue to play it. So, here's the thing. Um, I think what's kept us playing at number one is just sort of a sense of camaraderie. I mean, you know, at this point, we've all kind of 100%ed you know, like the single player stuff in the game, like all the encounters, all the missions, right, I was all wondering the side that. missions. Like, and is that like, is that work like Destiny? I mean, it's basically like a bunch of side missions, a, a cut like raids occasionally, group I, raids type of events or whatever. Yeah, I haven't played enough Destiny to make like a really good comparison between those two, but right. But based on what people have told me, the I mean, other than the mechanics being fundamentally different, first person shooter, third person cover based, you right? Know, yeah. But other than that, I mean, a lot of people have sort of made the summation that the division is just destiny on PC. Um. But uh, you know, initially, what kind of kept us going was trying to hundred percent the game, like go through all those missions, do all that stuff. Okay, then we did that, and then it was like, okay, well, you know, now like I want to max my character. I want to go level thirty, and you have two different character levels. You've got sort of your normal character level where the max is thirty. And then you have your dark zone character level, right? And that can go uh, that can go higher. That can go ninety nine. I, I honestly can't I can't remember what it is now. But anyway, but your dark zone level can go higher than thirty. And then they've added into this your gear score, and that's sort of like your beyond your character level. Your right. gear can you know can level up to you know two hundred and I don't know two hundred and twenty whatever the max is right now. Um, so progression is always something that you can be doing, and up to a point it works, you know, like after we kind of got done with like the main story stuff, we started working on the dark zone and you know, we tried it because we wanted to finish the main story, get the best gear we could before we went into the dark zone. And then we get into the dark zone to get even better gear. And for a while that was working. It was slow going, but we were getting better and better and better and better gear. 
but then it started to kind of fall off and we weren't really progressing all that much with our gear, just like very little bits, very, very slowly. Even, I mean, and we are by no means, you know, towards the top end of that scale. It's not like, oh, well, there's just nowhere else to go. I mean, like I said, like the top gear score, I think is like maybe 220 and we're all like around right now, like, you know, like 183 to 190 or something, you know, there's still plenty of room to grow there. Um, but we were starting to kind of slow down in the loop progression side of things. But then we got really interested in the incursion. And that is the, this huge horde mode thing that they, uh, this is like a free piece of DLC that came out in April. And uh, it's called Falcon Lost. And this is supposed to be like the thing you do to get, um, to get what's called gear sets. And gear sets are like really high end uh, bits of like armor and clothing. So like your backpack, your holster, uh, your knee pads, your gas mask, like all of those items that you wear on your person that contribute to your armor, but they also buff you in different ways. Gear sets uh, are are named pieces of gear that you can wear, and there's like four different types. There's like tactician, sentry, striker, and nomad. And depending on which one which one of these sets you have equipped, you'll get different buffs. So like as an as a example, I have the striker set. If you have two pieces of striker gear equipped on your character, then you get, you'll get a little bonus. Um, and if you have three pieces, then you'll get uh, a, another bonus for having three right. pieces and you can have up and up to four pieces. And then you get kind of like the maximum bonus for that particular armor set. So playing the Falcon lost incursion is a way to, to get those armor sets. And so that's been the thing we kind of been going after recently. And also just to beat Falcon lost, which I mean, you know, we were attempting for, I don't know. I mean, we tried it, you know, probably for a week or more, week and a half, we were trying to do that, that mission. And it was just kicking our ass. And part of it was, you know, just needing to kind of get our gear in a good place. Part of it was our strategy, not being as good as it could be. Part of it was just understanding what was happening and what we needed to do. But, you know, we kind of got better and better and better. And then finally, yesterday on part 43 of the stream, we finally beat Falcon Lost. And, um, and that, that, I mean, that was a really cool thing. I mean, you know, some of us got some pretty good gear out of that. I got like my fourth piece of striker gear. Krister got like his fourth piece of tactician's gear for his, uh, his armor set. So we, we saw, we, we did finally see a little bit of progression after a long time to sort of sit and still, it felt like. So the, I assume that DLC is, it's in the area of the world that's outside of the dark zone, right? That's not dark zone DLC. Uh, it, it actually, yeah, it's interesting. It's not in the dark zone. It, it, it's in the overworld. But it's interesting, you can actually see them on the map, like, you know, the, the area of the map you can play in, like Lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. like Falcon Lost is like at the, it's like at the, the southeastern corner of the playable area. Like, be, like, you can't really travel beyond, like, the Falcon Lost entry point, because the map dead ends there. And it's right. the same thing with the, the DLC, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the next piece of DLC, the next incursion, which is coming out uh, this month. Uh, that's already on the map. Like you can already see like, you know, where the entry point's going to be. And it's like, you know, like up on the North side at the very edge of the map. So it's interesting sort of geographically how these things slowly kind of begin to open up the map to, you know, to larger areas that weren't accessible prior. You know, one of the interesting, I was thinking about when you were talking about the progression <clears throat> in the dark zone and how the loot is shitty. I was, I was thinking about, you kind of run into a problem if they, if they increase the quality of the loot and allow you to progress faster, at some point, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, unless there's uh, they've accounted for this, but at some point, if everybody's gear is so good, you're almost cut it, cutting out the um, uh, the new player base. But I guess that happens in things like Battlefield and that sort of thing, too. I'm just thinking, like, if you were all got to 220 really quickly, yeah. it sort of becomes very averse to new players going into the Dark Zone. Well, here's what they've done for that. They, they, they've they've kind of attempted to address that in so far as like the gear score goes. So like, um, there is, there's a, a tier of the dark zone. And if you are below a gear score of 160, so like when you're starting out, let's say you'd be like, I don't know, let's say like 140 or something like that. So you go into the dark zone and you're going to be in that tier, which means the maximum gear level that you're going to see on any other player is going to be 160. Oh, interesting. So they kind of do these they do these brackets to to try to kind of keep smart. that thing fair. It's smart except that the next bracket is 161 to whatever the maximum gear score is. 
you know? So there's only two tiers. There's like noob and then everyone else. And so like for us, that was really frustrating, you know, because we'd be in there like at a gear score of like, you know, uh, one, you know, let's say like 170 and we're playing against people that have like a gear score of like 220. 220, right. Yeah. And they're just murdering us. But even to do anything, I mean, you, game, you have games like Battlefield or Call of Duty or whatever, the multiplayer, and you're just. It's always a you, challenge. You, you know, the you are, you're just screwed. Challenge. You start out new and it's just. And you just get killed. Right. But <laughs> yeah. that's one of the things. And I, I guess the thing that I want to say is that like a lot of the problems, we haven't really even talked about all of them, but because uh, we haven't even talked about like the glitching and the exploiting, which is, or, or the cheating, which has been huge. But yeah. Um, What's going on with that? I want to know. Well, uh, they've got a major problem with it. Uh, is is what's Spo- going on all of those things? I mean, a lot all of people of cheating. Things. There's 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 exploits. Like there's things that are fucked up in the game. That Can you people, give me a for instance? Yeah. So one of the one of the uh, the skills in the game is a bit of uh, portable cover that you deploy. Like kind of like you know you just sort of like whisk out this plate from nowhere and you toss it in front of you and it sort of like unfolds into like this shield stuck in the ground and you can get right. in cover behind it. And um, People discovered that they could uh, they could hack through walls with this thing. They could like stand up against a wall and like deploy this. The shield actually deploys on the other side of the wall, and then you go into cover and it pulls you through the wall and allows you to access areas of the map you're not supposed to be able to get to. Right. And so people were using that to like farm named bosses and things like that to get to uh, you know, to, to just get like really good loot really really quickly. So those like there's exploits, there's things like that that are occurring. Uh, that have been problematic just in terms of an unequal playing field, like you know, people being able to get the best loot really, really quickly. Right. There's other bugs, like there was one, um, and I, I guess this is fixed at this point, but uh, there was one that they had where, um, there was some sort of uh, there was some sort of like skill or or talent that you could have like on a weapon where it would um, it would increase your uh, it would increase your DPS. Uh, like while you were using a skill or something like that, and if you uh, people discovered that you could like hack this thing by like constantly like like basically activate the talent or whatever, and then like constantly switch weapons, and it would just keep increasing your damage like up to the point where you were going to do like let's say like a million like a million DPS, and so like one you could like one shot a tank. Right, you know, with a rifle or something like that. It was just, uh, and I think I think they've I think they addressed that in the one point one update. But uh, okay, so there's like those kinds of sort of just like exploiting like the game code, right? And then there's just like flat out cheaters, like people running cheat engines and right and doing things that aim bots and whatever. Yeah. So we actually had an interesting experience in the dark zone on one of the streams where we were uh, we were trying to extract some loot, and all of a sudden there's another player there and he's attacking us, and there's four of us. And generally speaking, if there's one person taking on a group of four, they've got to have some kind of ace in the hole because under on an even playing field, there's no way they take us. Right. So anyway, this one person shows up and attacks us. We start shooting, and then he just vanishes, just disappears. And we were like, wow, that was strange. And we were talking, like, do you think that was a cheater? Was, was it server lag? You know, what, what happened? So anyway, we finish the extraction. It's up on top of this building. We come down to the street level, and bam, we're getting attacked again. Different player, different name, but the exact same thing. Like he, like I think he attacked maybe like Lance. Like somebody went down, and I dove for cover, and like you know came out and just like started unloading a magazine into him. And after I was after I was about halfway down, he just vanished like right in front of me. Right. And so you know we reported like both of those players and and all that stuff, but you've got people doing that kind of thing. And the real problem with that, uh, as was making the rounds on the news a couple of weeks ago, there was like a, there was like, like basically like a network developer who took a look at the game and basically discovered that the way that the game is written, uh, it basically cannot, like you cannot fix like the cheating in the game without completely rewriting the code because the game is basically designed to trust the client side uh, program like running on your machine for things like you know telemetry and like like you know weapon stats and things like that so you know as far as like where you're moving to and like you know how much damage you can do the game the server side trusts the client side inherently and it's very easy to like I guess like hack the client side and like you know introduce false values into memory that the server then believes are legit uh, and he says that like this is something that's not going to get fixed with the patch like it's going to 
require like a major overhaul of a code to fix that part of the game. And have they commented on it? Not really. I don't think they've addressed that, but this week, as a matter of fact, it was just yesterday or the day before, uh, they, I guess like on one of like their weekly live streams, they, and, and you have to understand that, I mean, people have been up in arms about some of the stuff in the game. I mean, yeah, they've really been taking Yeah, I've a seen a few posts. So, I mean, I've seen a few articles about sure. it for sure. I haven't been paying close attention, but I've seen it. They've been taking a beating. And so finally this week, they announced uh, patch 1.2. They haven't announced a release date for it yet. They, we think it's going to be sometime this month, and a lot of people think that it's it might even come out, like maybe by next week. Because in theory, the uh, the next bit of DLC, the next incursion, if it comes out four weeks to the day after the the previous one, which was April twelfth, then people are expecting that to show up next week. And perhaps this patch will come out of it at the same time, but you know we don't know for sure yet. But anyway, the point is that the one point two patch on paper addresses everything except for the game is sort of fundamentally flawed on the cheating end. Like it's fundamentally vulnerable to, to uh, I'm saying fundamentally a lot this, this episode, so, <laughs> but the game is inherently sort of uh, vulnerable to cheating. <laughs> right. They don't really address that, but everything else, the shitty loot drops, um, so, some fixes, some fixes for, you know, broken things, exploits, exploits. Right. But also just like doors not opening, so you can't complete Was that missions. shit happening on the consoles, by the way? Um, so, like the, some the of exploits the, in the... Yes, yeah, so some of the exploits work on the consoles, yeah. Right. Um, um, so, but so, they're addressing a lot of that in this 1.2 update, they say. How many hours do, would you just guess you put into it? Oh, I've roughly? got like 117. Hang on, I got right. and so I in got computer open, right beside While me. you're looking, in 117 hours, is that the only time you've see, personally seen a cheater? That's the only time I've seen that kind of cheating. Like, we've... There, have there been other like there, things that you've seen like aimbots and I mean there's, <laughs> there's Crisis Two multiplayer yeah. was ruined because of cheating and it was it was pro- probably fifty to seventy percent of the matches I played in had very obvious people using aimbots and um, uh, infinite life hacks and damage mm-hmm. hacks I mean it was just coll- and it was obvious I have not honestly I mean like that that one instance I can point to that's the only instance where I know for a fact that somebody was cheating. We've gone up against other players where uh, we like, like the, where like, you come out of the encounter and you're like, yeah, wait, it's, really? It's, it's, there's like really? one guy, there's like one guy and like, we're all unloading on him and his health is just not depleting. You know, I mean, it's well, not, that's an obvious like, cheater. It's not that it's staying the same. It's like, it's like going down, going down, going down. And then like, it'll bump back up, but there are skills and things like that, you know, that allow you to do things. You know, th- there's like, you know, ultimate skills you can deploy that will decrease the, the damage you take. And, right. you know, like those kinds Maybe of things. Maybe heal or whatever. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's like that it's hard character to tell. is just so high level. Like if they are just like a maximum character, maximum level character with the best gear, it's possible that's, possible. that that's not cheating. That's just we're getting outclassed. But, right. and again, but that's kind of like a broken thing with like the dark zone brackets, which is one of the things they say they're going to do. You're going to have like the below 160 level, and then you're going to have like, 161 to 200 and then 200 and above so in theory they are trying to kind of even that out well well, that's a good thing yeah so so are you still having fun playing it or does it has it felt like a grind at any point yeah i mean i i would have to say that it it was beginning to feel like a grind for the last maybe week or two um but really the last couple weeks we were really focused on that falcon lost incursion and like trying to beat that and um so that was like really where our focus was. Now that we've done that, um, there is a kind of a sense of like, well, what do we do now? And the logical thing is to say, well, let's go into the dark zone and let's get better loot. But we all know that loot in the dark zone is kind of fucked up. And so now we, and now we also have this information that there's this 1.2 update that's going to. So you don't like, you're kind of like, why bother? It's like, mm, how much do we want to like grind rather than just wait for 1.2, come back and. And actually get some good loot for your efforts. Exactly. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at with it, and I think some of the other fellows are as well. Plus, there's Uncharted for next week, right? And I think we're all looking to play that. So I'm guessing that we are probably going to put the division down for a couple of weeks, right? While we play Uncharted, and once Wait this 1.2 patch. patch comes out, I think we'll come back to it. That's my yeah, that's so- my guess. I mean, we're playing tomorrow, but you know, right? <laughs> um, now I haven't, you know, I haven't asked you at all, Brent, and for a reason, uh, mm. I haven't asked you at all about the story, and and I there's a story? and the reason 
Right. The reason is I'm assuming that that the story, the dialogue, the that that whole piece of it just is essentially meaningless in the game. It is in multiplayer. Experience wise, it is in multiplayer. Although Ian, well, certainly, but Ian I mean, said what, that was, he played some of it solo, and he said that he he actually found it pretty good. He said that as a solo experience, like oh, when you say old, multiplayer, you mean you mean you guys playing co op, but even in the overworld, it, it yeah, it becomes irrelevant. But if you played the, the uh, overworld, is that what you called it? Uh, well, whatever. I mean, I don't know what they call it, right? But, you know, so, so but, but in the overworld, overworld, if you played it alone, you might care about it. Yeah, that that's what that's what Ian's uh, feeling was. He, he felt like playing solo. You know, because obviously you're playing with friends, you're talking, you're not paying attention to the dialogue. You're like skip cutscene, skip cutscene. You know, um, yeah, right. And you can play the entire game co-op. You know, with with right. as many as four people. But um, well, there are definitely games that I've played co-op mm-hmm. where we sit there and watch the cutscenes together and quietly. And this was not know, one of them, right? Yeah, I I have not been impressed by anything the game has done in terms of story, but I have not played any of it solo either. Uh, right. Maybe if I rerolled a character and started over maybe i'd feel differently but ian ian thought that it was not bad single player but that that would that would be the caveat i'd put on is that if you want to get anything out of the story either you have to have a group of friends that are really committed to that or play it by yourself right um uh all right so what do you what what else have i missed i mean it's the the conversation's been all about mechanics which is essentially Mm -hmm. what the game is all about and about playing together Mm -hmm. um there wasn't i didn't I didn't feel like, and you confirm that, like story wise, you much. know, music. Those aren't the kind of things we're talking about about this game. No. Um, is there anything you know that I missed that that uh, you want to talk about? The things that are really good about it, uh, I think, are the 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 cover the cover mechanics and sort of like the tactical side of things. Like this is a game where you're talking about like you have the guy who's on the iPad playing. And you're, I, you're wish, just, I wish you're, I wish we had that. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I wish that the game sort of existed in that form today, or maybe it will eventually. I don't know. But um, the thing that I love about this game is before we go into, you know, like a mission or something like that that we're going to do, something that like on challenging that's actually going to be a little bit tough. I love the fact that we take a second and say, okay, so like Fatui and I are going to go here. And we're going to be in this position, and we're going to be firing on them. And then, like Lance, you and Krister, you guys like go over here, and we'll kind of have them like in an L-shaped ambush. And like as those guys come out, like we'll we'll try to you know flank them from our position, and then we'll funnel them towards you guys, and you guys flank them. You know, like we talk about like tactics and strategy, like where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing, and the amount of teamwork that the game rewards, that the game sort of incentivizes and rewards as far as like how you have your character spec'd out and the different things that you can do. So like right now, like I'm really like so you, your all specs about are DPS com- as an example. Like I'm just right, like, so you guys DPS. are running complimentary yeah. uh, soldiers. Exactly. And like Christer's like, he's like our, he's like our heel guy. And you know, Fatui, like it, it, he kind of ends up being a tank. We don't know why, but for some reason, like Fatui a bullet magnet, like enemies love to shoot at him. I'm that way. And, I'm, a, I'm always the meat shield. <laughs> right. But uh, Fatui, like, like he's like he's really big, like on his sniper rifle. Like he's got a sniper rifle with like all these, like you know, he's be buffed like his critical hit chance and his critical hit damage, where he can do like ridiculous amounts of damage, like on a headshot with a critical hit. And so, you know, each of us like you know kind of has like you know this thing, and like Lance and I both tend to like kind of share like crowd control duties, uh, using like flashbangs and things like that to like slow down mobs as they're rushing us so that we can pick them off and. You know, just coordinate, like, like things that you do in MMOs, like where you have to kind of, you have to focus your fire. Like you got to like, cause you can't just like all take a guy and, and shoot him and bring him down. Like you've all got to be shooting, like at least two or three of you got to be shooting the same guy. If you want to have a hope of dropping them before they, they get to you and just start routing you. And so like, you know, marking targets or like, you know, calling out things like, okay, let's take out, you know, let's prioritize taking out the grenadiers and then let's work on the snipers and then we'll start working on the foot soldiers and I love that this game has that sort of level of tactical uh, mechanic built into it. That really, really appeals to me. And the teamwork that we end up utilizing to to do missions and things is awesome. I mean, those parts of the game, just like those fundamental mechanics of cover, you know, firing, reloading, return fire, trying to like overlap, you know, so that like I'm firing while Fett uh, is uh, reloading. And then his magazine drains and, you know, I've got a fresh, you know, just like those kinds of things. That stuff is awesome about the game. It really, really is rewarding. 
and it's good enough that we keep coming back despite all these problems. That you, that that stuff. I mean, I don't mean to be you know silly, but that stuff is kind of magical. I mean, I love playing. Playing with other people is fantastic, and yeah, there's nothing like Battlefield Four is a great example. There's nothing in the world I love more than me and Aaron. Uh, spending uh, four hours doing nothing but chasing helicopters down as a team and coordinating like Mm -hmm. how we're going to just bring the helicopters down or based on our classes and what we're using and all that stuff. And it's, it is, it's tremendous amount of fun. And this game uh, obviously lends itself to that. It sounds awesome in that regard. It it really is. I I think, I think the fundamental thing about the game that is terrific is, is, is the teamwork, The, the teamwork stuff that you can get out of this game is fantastic. And, you know, like our, 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 our successful run on Falcon Lost yesterday, I mean, after trying so many times and finally getting in, getting to the end of that. And it was because we were like really focused and coordinated and saying like, okay, you know, I'm going here, you know, you go and turn off this turret while I run and plant these explosives. And it was just, it was fantastic. That, that part of the game is brilliant and, uh, and really, really fun. And if they can get some of these other things fixed, I think the game could have legs. Oh, it's already got legs for you to a point. You put put 120 hours into it. That's true. I have, but uh, you know, I might be I might be in the minority. There's plenty of people that have left at this point. Uh, all right. So before we switch over to the rift, yeah. Anything else? No. I mean, did I leave anything out? That, that's it. I mean, I, I've been playing that and nothing else. I really actually need to get back and finish uh, XCOM Two. I've still got the last mission of XCOM Two that I haven't gotten to. But I mean, I I have like two and a half hours or so a day to game. And ever since the division came out, my two and a half hours have, have been, been going sp- to that. Have been spent. Have you with the seen? Guys uh, have you seen Alienation game. on uh, PS4? No. The guy, the twin stick shooter from uh, um, the guys at Housemark that did um, Dead Nation. Mm-hmm. How is it? Uh, I haven't played it yet, but it looks like tons of fun. I was thinking that would be a good thing for us to play together too. Oh, we should try it. Uh, if I ever play another game outside of VR, that is. Well, there is that, of course. And before we fully transition over and talk about yes. VR, the last thing that I just want to say about. Uh, about the division the thing about the division that has been so awesome is that it has also i think been an opportunity for the outlaw gamers and and our amazing community to kind of shine because of course you know there's tons of people from the site that you know come into the chat and you know are watching us play esteban's usually there uh you know kicking us in the balls and laughing at us when we get shot in the face but um like you know i'm in i'm in the states i'm in the eastern time zone of course i'm on third shift hours and you know so it's kind of a, like I'm usually getting up in the afternoon to play this thing. Fatui's in Denmark. Christer's in Sweden. Lance lives in Japan. And so like Lance is getting up at like four o'clock in the morning to play. Christer and Fatui are staying up until like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm basically waking up uh, after usually six or seven hours of sleep. I'm getting up earlier than I normally would to try to play this. Like it really is kind of interesting what a, uh, what a miraculous thing it is that like these four people in these four different parts of the world have managed to, you know, find like that two and a half hour gap that we can actually play together. It's it's actually quite remarkable in that sense. That's awesome. So anyway, that's the last. That's just the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, it it has been a lot of fun actually playing with those guys. It, it, like I told you uh, not too long ago, I haven't had that. I haven't had that much experience being able to play games with our audience. It's, just because of like my schedule yep. and everything, I just haven't yep. had the same free time other people usually do. Uh, it, it's been a problem for you and I trying to find free time to play together. Yeah. That has been really, really rewarding. It is really, and I, I play. I've had the good fortune to play with a, a bunch of the guys in Battlefield, and played the Overwatch beta recently. And it yes. is it's just tons. I play Rocket League with the guys, and it's it's a lot of fun. It's really, really rewarding, and that's awesome. I agree. absolutely awesome. So let's let's go over to uh, you and let's start talking about VR. Yeah. So yeah. when when did you get your when did you get your rift? So I got my rift. You know, we're recording Thursday, May fifth. I got it uh, Thursday, last Thursday. I've had it for a week now. I uh, I ended up my pre order. So just really quickly, this is the story. I, I ordered. Th- I started ordering the minute they went go. Uh, the pre orders went live on January sixth. Mm-hmm. The website was borked, and it took me about thirty minutes to get my order through. Nice. 30 minutes uh, got me the, the Rift released, quote unquote, on March 28th. I'm sure everybody's read about the shipping shit. Oh, yeah. We can talk about it, but we don't really need to. But um, my initial ship date was sometime in April. My order got bumped to May 23rd to June 2nd, between a shipping window of May 23rd to June 2nd. Okay. Um, uh, so that 30 minutes cost you quite a bit of time. 
a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, the months actually. And then, uh, on April 22nd, which was a Friday, I I've been reading Reddit daily since, uh, before March 28th, Mm -hmm. Oculus, the Oculus subreddit. And, um, Somebody posted about the bundles uh, at Best Buy and uh, the PC bundles, which are $1,500. Uh, and Best Buy has a, a re- return policy where they'll refund the entire cost of the PC. Uh, and many people actually were just able to cancel the PC. They weren't selling the Rift on its own. They were just you getting could, these bundles and returning the PCs. Which is what I did. I got a bundle and then returned the PC and canceled my pre-order with Oculus. Yeah. Um, a lot of people were able to actually order the bundle and just cancel the PC online in their order cart, in their order after ordering. So they only ever got the... And the Rift, Rift shipped directly to them. They didn't cancel the Rift. So a ton of people went online, bought these bundles, and took the computers back, so, which is what I did. Here's the thing. Number one, that's awesome that you were able to do that and get your yes. Rift you know, much earlier than you would have otherwise. Number two, that's fucking terrible that yes. it's available retail to anybody while the people who backed the project from the beginning and believed in it when not even Facebook believed in it are getting the short end of the stick. That's fucking that's correct. awful. It is awful. And, you know, here's the long and the short of it. I, you know, I was pissed off and annoyed by it. All that's kind of gone away since I've got my Rift, obviously. Right. But, but um, the long and the short of it is, I, you know, I don't think Oculus was being... Um, purposefully consumer averse that they don't want to hurt their fan base. No, this, they don't want to hurt their customer I agree. base. This was a mistake, but it was I just think they colossally mistake. fucked it up. Right. And they, they made commitments to Best Buy and Amazon and Microsoft mm-hmm. that by contractually, I'm sure they had to fulfill. And they made the mistake of not putting something in the contract. I'm assuming these are all assumptions, but I, you know, they don't want to fuck us over um, on purpose, but they got, they backed themselves into a corner where they were forced to fuck us over time and time again. Yep. And it sucks and it feels shitty. And what it led to, honestly, Brent, was like, I, you know, I've been waiting, I had the DK1, I've been waiting for this thing for fucking years. January 6th came, I was on the site the fucking second they went live, they fucked up their website, I ended up getting late, but that's okay, it happens, whatever, I had, I was so fucking jacked, like a, like a, a dog with a ball waiting for it to be thrown, jacked, excited about the rift, and by the time all this shit happened, I, I, I stopped caring, uh, and, and I, I was this close real literally to canceling my pre-order and saying forget it you know what fuck it i'll just i'll wait six eight nine months it's not like it's not the end of the world and it it really one guy wrote on reddit and and he really said it right he's like i'm still getting my rift i still want it but you sort of have shit on my dreams you know you took something that i that was so excited and so beautiful about and you've ruined this time this should be a special time where you're seeing this paradigm shifting technology being launched into the consumer um ether and uh it should be an exciting time for especially for those of us who have been on this journey for a few years this should be an exciting time and they it, and they turned it into like the drunk fucking dad at the birthday party right you know like right. they just ruined what should be a special occasion so whatever all that being said i got my rift and and uh i don't give a shit about any of that anymore what's the first thing you played first thing i played was um that's a fucking good question. I think the first thing I played was Oculus Dream Deck, which is a series of about six or eight, maybe eight tech demos that they um, they had been using previously that they just put into a little package. Right. Have you, thus far, have you used desktop VR? I have. I've used for both virtual desktop, uh, which I have bought and returned, mm-hmm. uh, and I have used uh, a free program that was released a couple weeks ago called Big Screen, which is... Yep. Uh, quite literally, one of the best VR experiences I have ever I have had. It's I re- and I'll tell you about it. Ironically enough, out of everything that I've read about in the press, like the thing that I am most excited about on some level is just desktop VR. Like just having VR goggles instead of a desktop, and the idea that you can have a screen any size you want. The free program that you're talking about, uh, I've read about quite a bit, and even in its current state, um, it still seems pretty cool. Dude, it's so. Let me tell you. So we can talk about this. So VR, uh, uh, desktop VR, um, or virtual desktop, excuse me, is what the program is called. Mm-hmm. Uh, was also one of the things I was most excited about. It's fifteen bucks. You can use your desktop screen any size you want. They have some theater and home theater environments to watch movies. Yep. Uh, they do side by. So it's it's a little bit easier to watch your own videos through a virtual desktop than than through Oculus's official app. Although you can do it through Oculus's official app. You just have to change one of the text files, any file type thing. Um, uh, 
and it does side by side 3D, which Oculus doesn't do right now in terms of your own videos. I mean, Oculus, of course, will will do 3D video and 360 video. But sure. um, uh, so I was super excited about it. Um, the limitations are the desktop piece of it and doing work is totally doable. There's the limitation of not being able to see your keyboard, right? That's the yep. the one of the limitations of doing work. Although you would be amazed at how much you can actually do on your machine using just a mouse um, and a few like. You know, you go to Google and you start to type shit to look up Netflix, or you know, if you know where your favorites are, and yeah. you're you can do a lot with just a mouse. Uh, it's very fucking cool to um, uh, to um, watch, you know, uh, Netflix or whatever. And then I also somebody at Reddit figured out and it's fucking awesome. There's a PS4 Remote Play app that allows you to play your PS4 games on your PC, mm-hmm. and you can actually do that within Virtual Desktop and play your PS4 games in the movie theater. Or in a home theater. Not a bad way to spend an evening. Not a bad way to spend an evening. It's fucking awesome. And it was cool. And I liked it. But it wasn't as like mind-blowing as I thought it would be. Then I got big screen. And big screen is free. And big screen is, number one, it's a, it's a fully rendered apartment, which allows you to go into like five or six rooms. It's, it overlooks LA. One of the, one of the uh, nighttime LA. One of the rooms is a mm-hmm. um, balcony. You can be on the balcony. Um it is a multiplayer experience where four people can be together in on, say, the balcony, sitting on a couch next to each other. Each person has what would be the equivalent of probably, I don't know, maybe a 36 or 42-inch screen right in front of them of their desktop. Um, and you can see everyone else's desktop. That's awesome. Okay, And so, so I'm, I'm taking you step-by-step step through this. So four of us sitting on a couch. Each of us has a TV that's like right in front of us at an angle. Mm-hmm. Uh, with our own desktop, I can look to the left and see your desktop, and look to the right and see Fatui's desktop or whatever. So it's like a, if I look, it's like a really awesome giant LAN party in VR. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. I look to the left, I see a white rendition of your head. It's not you; it doesn't look like you at all. It's just a blank white avatar head. Yeah. But when you and I converse, I can see your head tilting and moving and looking at me, and the audio is positional, and I fucking feel like I'm having a conversation with you right next to me. Even it though it's just un- like, a white, like a white mannequin thing. Even though we're at the point where it's a white mannequin head. And at some and point, it's not, not going to be distant- a white mannequin head forever. Nope. And sometime in the, dist- in the not too distant future, I guarantee to you, we will all go to Walmart or Rite Aid or Walgreens. wherever the fuck they put these. 3D scan. And they're going to. 3D scan, and you can have your own avatar head in there. That's going to happen because yeah. even without that shit, speaking to you in, in 3D space like that is fucking remarkable. And then on top of that, mm-hmm. I can take that desktop television window I have in front of me, and I can do whatever the fuck I want with it. So I can make it 200 inches tall and put it about 10 feet away. Just make it like, so, like a wall. Like, hey, that wall over there is my screen. All four of you can now see my uh my desktop and whatever's on it so we can watch a netflix movie together i was playing uncharted using the ps4 remote play while three guys from all over the world were watching me play it just like we're hanging out on the couch at your it was fucking incredible brent i can't even begin to describe to you how incredible it was you remember back when we were like talking one time on the show last year this was back uh this was back on uh, uh outlaw gamer radio and we were talking about you know, like the paradigm of like your like your desktop theme, and you know we 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 imagine well like you know like my desktop theme would be the uh, the uh, carbonite freeze chamber from Cloud City and Empire Strikes Back. Like you know like that, that's where like I would like go and like I'd have my computer workstation there and the screens would be whatever size I want. You know, it'd look it look like a bat computer. Like it'd be like you know really wicked cool and everything. This program is like it's that software. It's just, you know, like waiting to sort of be expanded into things other than an apartment overlooking L.A. But like and the and the apartment is super compelling almost because of the reality of it. But yeah. you're right. So this guy has said it's going to be free software. He wants it to be like Skype yep. and he's going to make money off of selling things like environments and premium stuff. There you go. Um, and it is. So right now, there's things in it that you can't do right now. So if we sit and watch, you can't. There's no desktop audio, for example. Okay. So if you're watching me play Uncharted, you can't hear my my desktop. That's the next on his list, and I bet it will be out within a week or two. Um, he's going to create other environments, including a th- movie theater, um, a full on full size movie theater, um, you know, and home theater and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's, but but it's in its in, infantile states state right now, and it is fucking amazing. It's interesting to me that, you know, the thing about this, and I, I know that this speaks to both your as well as my own 
interest in, in VR and how VR can be so compelling. It, it's interesting that I think for a lot of people who are on the outside looking in, they see VR as being a very um, introspective experience, like something that you're doing that's kind of like shutting out the world and people Alone. around you. Yeah, yep. something that you do uh, in a solitary state. And it's really interesting to me to hear you kind of talk about and get really excited about the social experience that VR offers, even in this really rudimentary uh, early form. It's insane. And it will, I mean, it will take people who make that argument and it will, it's worrisome actually, Brent. I mean, it is worrisome because it's so compelling and so real, but let me back up for a second and tell you that. So I, I didn't do that stuff right out of the gate though. Okay. Uh, and when I want, I do want to back up just a little bit and, and, um, just tell you the beginning of my experience with it. Cause the first night when I went to bed, I, I was wondering, did I spend $600 and I shouldn't have, and maybe I should sell this. <laughs> um, that bad. Because, huh? So the rift itself is, um, is, uh, extremely elegant. It, it, it's Apple quality. Can, can you like hold it up and show it to me? Is it right there next to you? Uh, yeah, it is right here next to me. I was actually going to start the podcast out by wearing it. Ooh, um, pretty. I was going to hold the podcast out, start the podcast out by wearing it. Cause it's got an internal microphone. Um, yeah. it's also got connected earphones, which I'll talk about later, which is a big, big, big deal. It's extremely well designed. You put it on like a hat. So it actually, it stretches. Oh, yeah, you put it on the back of your head first and stretch it over. How's the, uh, uh, how's and there's the only a single cable here. Fantastic. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's, it is, it is, um, elegant as all get out packaging every piece of it is screams of being consumer ready. Cool. That being said, yeah. um, there is a, still a bit of a screen door effect. Uh, you might have people heard people talk about God rays. That does occur in there, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the resolution, while it's 10, 1080 by 1200 per eye, which is, you know, almost, it's, it's essentially 720p-ish, uh, but not 1080p. Mm-hmm. It's still not what we are used to in modern gaming. Yeah. And, and, and it makes sense, because I have a 970 that will run something like Battlefield, at 60 plus frames a second, like on ultra or super high. Right. Well, you can imagine when I take that same game and I split it into two images still uh, and, ha- and have to render it at 90 frames per second yeah. um, over, over what is the equivalent of 26, 2160 by 2400 or whatever, it's not going to be able to run it at the same resolutions, it's, right? It makes total sense. It's processor but intense. It is extremely, extremely uh, hardware intense right now, although with the advent of the new... Um, uh, chipsets coming out for graphics processing in this this year. Uh, that's not going to be the case for long. But mm-hmm. but uh, um, I I, th- I think three years and like a like a like a relatively modest gaming PC is going to do really good VR. Yeah, I mean they're saying that the new Pat they're saying the new Pascal and the new uh, AMD are going to be the equivalent of a 980 Ti at three hundred dollars, uh, which is ridiculous. There you go. <laughs> All right, and like this year. Um, so. Uh, so at first I was like, oh, the resolution, you know, I mean, it's, it's way better than the DK one, blah, 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 blah. But, but I was a little, my expectations were really high. And it came um, short. And then I started, and, and then I got back in the next day and there's, I, uh, there's no fucking, que- I, if, if I die tomorrow, I, I would have been sad had I not had this experience. It is, it is singular. It is literally, literally Brent, unlike any other media or entertainment experience you that that's out there. It's just it's unbelievable. So I know that uh I know that you own the Rift. I don't know if you've had the opportunity. I don't think you have. You haven't had the opportunity to experience the Vive no. or like the PlayStation VR at like like an event no. somewhere. Although I've read a like a ludicrous amount and I can give you yeah. somewhat of an assessment of the differences, but I've not personally done it. Do you do you feel like do you feel that like those those three different VR systems are they all aimed at the same consumer? Are they all doing something fundamentally different? Are they all trying to do the same thing, and some of them are just doing it better than others? W- what is your take right now on, on the VR field? No, the, so the, the Vive and the Rift are aimed at the su- same consumer, um, and the PSVR is aimed at a different consumer, and, and that's almost entirely about price point and console install base. So, uh, you know, PSVR is going after people that own a PS4, uh, or you'll be able to get the PSVR ostensibly uh, and the console for the same price you'd get just for the Rift or, or uh, um, Vive headset, essentially. And then you need the computer for the Rift and the Vive. So, so they are going for different consumers in that regard. 
Um, the and and the PSVR will be lower spec, um, but has than than these two, and, the, and there's no question about that. But also has some big positives. It's supposed to be extremely comfortable. Uh, the price point is is much different, obviously, and they have some really really good first party titles. It looks like coming to VR uh, that are going to be exclusive. And they've committed to a lot of third party titles as well. Yes, and they, they have a, they're going to have a good amount of exclusives. Uh, the Vive and the uh, Rift offer a, a higher end experience, uh, similar to a high end gaming PC versus a console. There's no question about that. Vive and Rift are going after the same consumers, but the difference, the separator now is the motion controls, right? Or the hand controls, hand, tracked hand controls. The Vive has them right now, the Rift does not. Everything I have read, uh, and the Rift is coming out, they're called, they're called the Oculus Touch controllers. They're coming out this year. We don't have a release date yet, we don't have a price yet. They probably will be between one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars. My guess is closer to one hundred and fifty, um, and they will likely be out on you know in fall is what, kind of what the rumors are right now. But maybe holiday time. You never know. Um, so uh, basically, everything I've read, forgetting like how pissed off you are at Oculus for how they treat their customers and yeah. how that affects you want to do business or brand loyalty to Valve or whatever. Mm-hmm. Everybody that I've read that has both headsets says the same thing over and over and over and over again which is essentially the Rift feels like a polished consumer product. The Vive feels like a dev kit. What they do... Well, is I mean, isn't that kind of the case, though? I mean, like, what's out no, there right now? No, the Vive is a consumer product. I, is, this, not, is this their final consumer product that's out there? Yeah, this is the, for this generation, it is, okay. yes. Um, and it is, it is being sold that way, and it is. Now, um, the reason people say that is it just it doesn't feel quite as polished uh, as the Rift does. Just the packaging, the, the way it's put together... The the the, um, the Vive does not have included headphones. Uh, it has uh, a place they send you earbuds, and you can plug in earbuds or your own headphones. But it does require putting on an additional e- headset for the ears, yeah. um, which may or the, may not work all that well with the the Vive. Um, the 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 quality of the picture, that kind of stuff, is essentially the same. The Vive has a slightly wider FOV. Most people say it doesn't. It's not really that noticeable. For some people, it's a big deal. The uh, Rift has much worse God rays than the Vive does. Vive supposedly has a little bit more of a screen door effect, but essentially they're the same screens. And the performance in terms of tracking, while I've seen people post otherwise, they're essentially, for all intents and purposes, are roughly the same. Very good tracking. The difference is, is that the Vive has hand controllers right now, mm-hmm. and the and the Rift does not. And for some people, that anybody who's used hand controllers. Most people say once you use hand controllers, it's almost impossible to go back because it's so compelling that you feel like you're literally your hands are tied if yeah. you don't have the hand controllers. And so for a lot of people, that's super important. For me, uh, and, the, and the other piece is the, the, the Rift ecosystem. Now, there's a lot of people that have issues with the Rift ecosystem in the context of no return policy, the way that Steam has one, and some of the terms and services on the Rift, uh, people feel like it's too invasive. But the Rift, it, it, this is, again, sort of like an Apple... Android or Apple PC comparison, the Rifts it's just, is a very, very polished, well put together, well thought out ecosystem. Uh, the Steam VR is there; it's just not quite as elegant. And obviously, the the thing about touch controls—I mean, I mean, that's something that you and I have talked about a lot. We we both know that um, we both know that, like, e- I think even the controllers are only a stepping stone towards what VR needs to eventually have. Something like the um, well, like the like the Manus like, VR gloves that uh, right Jess uh, Jess Conant wrote about a couple of months back. You know, she she said that like you know for her like those those gloves that ability to have like that tactile interaction that is that's where VR needs to go. And I would suspect my guess is it depends on when Gen Two of these headsets is whether it's two years three years, um, but I'm guessing it's somewhere around two to three years would be my guess. Right. Um, and if it makes it to three years for this generation of these headsets, my guess is we might have something like that by then. Um, tons of people are doing work on this, so yep. that's the that's, that's, that's the sort of vibe. Like, and that's before we start, like you know, getting like those those like glove controllers or whatever that start inter- introducing like haptics and you know like feedback. Uh, Right, yeah, and, and then people like that. are working on that stuff. So that's the Vive Rift thing. The reason I stuck with the Rift was a couple of things. Number one, I just got the and everybody says that the Vive headset is much heavier. Yeah, and for some people, that's problematic when you're wearing it. It's got three. It's got a triple cable coming off the back, whereas Oculus only has one. That creates extra weight. Um, so the reason I stuck with the Rift was number one because um, the Vive looked like that to me. It looked like kind of was heavier and more cumbersome. And yeah. the other one was. Um, 
you know, I wasn't overly concerned about the room scale or, or touch controllers at this point, which I still am not. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything yet. Um, I mean, that's kind of me. I mean, it sounds good, but it's like I don't have a room to dedicate to VR. So I don't even room scale. I don't mm-hmm. really care about. It's more of just having the hand controllers to reach at things in the game, yeah. which you could do in a seated experience. But even that, I'm totally comfortable waiting, and and uh, it has turned out to to have paid off. When I'll and I'll tell you about the games uh, in just a moment, but. Um, so, so that's you know that's kind of why I, I chose to stick with the Rift. Uh, the Vive is uh, people who have the Vive. Nobody, nobody's complaining about the Vive and saying it's shitty, and nobody's doing that about the Rift either. Everybody, people are pretty happy with their purchases. People that got both have a preference. Mm-hmm. People that got one are all, from what I've seen, pretty okay, happy with, with their experiences. That's correct. Well, I have uh, going back to just one thing. I don't want to. We don't have to go down this rabbit hole too far. But one thing mm-hmm. that uh, that you said that did kind of resonate with me and it's something that i've read quite a bit about is that you can't underestimate how much the surround sound the the positional audio on the rift how much of the experience that constitutes well so a that's true but b uh you also can't underestimate how the value of having it included as part of the headset and i think that was a major oversight on htc's part which i'm sure they will rectify the next go around because uh, I had the DK1, and it's a colossal pain in the ass to put on headphones after, like, after you've put on the headset itself. And when you're, it's fine if for a developer kit, but when you're talking about a consumer product, it, it's it's far from elegant. Uh, it's it's a pain in the ass, and to be able to put that Rift on as a whole, the the earphones are very very good. Yeah. Um, they are uh, while they're not over, they're over the ear, but they're not cans, so they don't like block out all the sound. When you're in a game, I hear nothing else around me unless somebody really wants to talk to me and comes in here and talks to me, and I can hear them. It's perfect. And they did a, the, the, the actual physical design of them is fucking brilliant because they slide up and down, back and forth, and out side to side, almost like gull wing doors off your head just enough. So it's really easy to get them where you need them to be. I've had no issue with it at all. It, it all just works seamlessly. And when I put on the headset, the Rift headset has a sensor in it. So it knows when it's on, and it automatically starts the Oculus Home software. So you sit down at your computer, you pick up the headset, you put it on like a hat, and you wait about 30 seconds, and you're in the Oculus Home. And that's it. It's that simple. On and off, no problems. You don't have to fire up software. It does it automatically. It's really, really elegant. And the sound is phenomenal. And yes, sound is colossally important, Brent. And the fact that game manufacturers makers can... can um, uh, design their sound around a, a fixed set of hardware makes a big difference. Uh, how before we before we get to the games and we got to get to the games, um, any any motion sickness problems and any, any any of those experiences like you had with the DK one, which I had pretty pretty badly. Yeah. And um, I had on the very first day. There's a couple games that are more nausea inducing than others, like E Valkyrie um, uh, was a little uncomfortable for me. There are a couple other games that were a little uncomfortable, and I had a little ginger ale, you know, like the first couple of <laughs> yeah, times. Yeah. But I have now probably put 30 hours into VR, 20 hours in 25. And uh, other than the first day, I've experienced nothing. And now I slip in and out of it, no problems, no nausea, no nothing. Excellent. And that speaks to the quality of the lenses, the screens, the yeah. positional tracking, all that stuff. The, the things that are challenging, locomotion is really challenging when you're sitting down because it just doesn't make sense for your brain. Yeah. So games, sometimes I play games standing up, and it, it makes a lot more sense to my brain. Okay, so let's talk about the games. Give me a brief overview of what you played, and then let's talk, let's talk about uh, a couple of your favorites. Sure. So I played the two games that I got with the pre-order, E Valkyrie, uh, which is from um, uh, CCP, the guys that do EVE, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Lucky's Tale, which was designed by um, Playful, um, which is the sort of Mario-esque game that, that came with it also. Uh, and then I've also played Blaze Rush, which is a ten dollar downloadable title that is a like a little mini car racing game. You race little mini cars on a track in front of you. Yeah. Um, I played Chronos. Um, I've played uh, The Climb. Uh, I've played um, the the Rift itself comes with a game a game ish thing called um, I think it's Farlands Farsky. I can't remember. Um, what else have I played? Uh, well, here, let me just pull up my library. I think that, as far as games go, that may be it. Um, oh, Defense Grid 2. Oh, sweet. Defense Grid 2 in VR, which is one of the games I want to, you know, we're not going to talk about all the games, but I want to talk about 
certain games, and that's one of the games I want to talk about. So yeah, Defense Grid 2, Blaze Rush, Kronos, a game called Rooms the Unsolvable Puzzle, which is a puzzle game, obviously. Uh, the Climb, Lucky's Tale, Eve Valkyrie, Farlands, uh, and that's it for games. All right, so let's talk about a few of your favorites. Like, like what, are, what are the titles that have really risen to the top that have taken your time? I can tell you unquestionably, uh, very, very easily I can tell you this, uh, uh, and in no particular order, Blaze Rush, there, I mean, so Blaze Rush, um, uh, Blaze Rush, The Climb, Defense Grid 2, uh, VR, and Kronos are my favorite games, but Lucky's Tale is also a fantastic game. Um, so Blaze Rush, like I said, it's like you're driving toy cars around, you have uh, pickups where you can shoot at other cars, stuff like that. It is. I, I said the other day, it's kind of like the Rocket League of early VR. Right. It's a $10 game. It doesn't seem like it would be that big of a deal. I played it for two hours last night with a shit-eating grin on my face the entire time. The matches are five minutes, roughly. You just go from one match to the other, and it's just this loop of like stupidly fun car racing, like like those matchbox cars yeah. almost, on a tr- three virtual track, and you can like lean in and look at it, and the animations are awesome, the explosions are awesome, your car goes flying off the track, and it's just it's just fun. It, it, it's really interesting, and, and I I think you know perhaps in a way it's it's very appropriate that you know something like like that game or you know Defense Grid Two, they're not like the thing that immediately springs to mind when I think Mm-mm. of VR. You know, it's not like that immersive, um, you know, sort of oasis like experience. But in a sense, that totally figures given like where VR is right now, like like the limitations of like you know those games work really well with like an Xbox 360 controller. You know, as an example. But it's not um, even it's so it's hard and all of this, Brent, as as you know, and I hope you appreciate. And by the way, the Rift is going into Best Buy stores this weekend. Forty eight stores are demoing the Rift, so you can look up whether or not there's a, a store in your area, yeah. and you can schedule an appointment to go demo the Rift. But um, all of this is going to is very hard to explain to you in a way that you will understand it until you've experienced mm-hmm. it. But and, and I, I know everybody says that, and it's colossal. It's just so true. But but. The thing that you that you like now don't plan on is the fucking menu screens are an awesome experience, right? Uh, in these games, like it, it, just the whole like in Defense Grid Two, is fucking amazing. I almost didn't buy it because I was like, I played it. I played all these other Defense Grid games. Mm-hmm. Do I want to spend thirty bucks? And I was like, God damn it! I just want to see it's early VR, and it was amazing. Just the like sitting in the menu screens, looking over the Defense Grid like it's a little mini chess game in front of you, like from Star Trek or Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And then you can go down to the tower level, and you can like zap down to tower level, and now you're in the board, and all the towers are eight feet tall, right. and you're watching the bugs go in front of you, and it's just it's fucking incredible. And and you're looking when they when you do that, you're down at tower level, and and so I don't know if you remember, but in Defense Grid Two, uh, or in Defense Grid and Defense Grid Two, there's like. Um, an indicator in the HUD about how many resources you have left. Yeah. There's an indicator of what kind of troops are there, right? Mm-hmm. And when you're looking down on the game from above, as if, as if it's a chessboard in front of you, those indicators are sort of, they're in 3D and they're virtual reality and they feel like they have depth, but they're like a HUD kind of and they're off to the side. When you go down and teleport down to board level and the towers look eight feet tall and you're on board level, you look up and 100 feet or 80 feet above you are those giant <laughs> HUD pieces like floating in, in, the in the sky. <laughs> exactly. And it's just fucking awesome. Yeah. And you look up there and you're like, oh my God, that's the HUD. And it's all the way up there. And it's incredible. And Blaze Rush, same thing in the menu screen. There's like these, these 150 foot tall screens showing gameplay videos right. while you're looking at the like UI in front Which of you. Which would be completely impractical if you know, you're controlling the camera with a controller. But if all you got to do is glance up, it makes sense. Yeah, which is exactly yeah. what you do. It's very compelling. It's it, it's just it's so interesting to kind of think about, you know how how little it kind of takes. Now, admittedly, maybe you and I are easy to please, and others aren't. But it, it's really interesting how little it, it does, how little it takes uh, to really kind of exploit that immersiveness that that VR offers as a platform. It's a matter of learning the language, Brent, and the fact, and again, I salute Oculus for, for waiting as long as they did to put out this game library, which, to be honest with you, when I looked at it sort of before I had VR, I was like, God, none of those games are really compelling to me. Right. 
And and now that I'm in it, they're phenomenally done and it makes all the difference. And once people, they're just, you can see that they're learning the language. So the other game I really want to tell you about, Brent, is The Climb. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely want to hear about that one. So 50 bucks, the whole game is like, uh, you're a pair of two hands, disembodied hands, and you're climbing up mountains, mm-hmm. right? La rock climbing. There's only three mountains. And so I very, like many people, I was like, wow, 50 bucks for a game that has one mechanic and there's only three environments to do it in. And I decided to take the plunge. And it is, I'm so glad I did, Brent. It is so worth the $50. I can't even tell you. You play the whole game. First of all, the hands are modeled beautifully and they're right in front of you. Uh, and, uh, and, and they, I, I, I thought it'd be weird to play with disembodied hands, uh, but it wasn't, they, they work really, really well. They're beautifully modeled, but you play the game standing up and they've done this amazing thing where you have to like, for example, you'll have to sometimes look physically, look around a corner on the mountain, on the rock face to reach a handhold that's on the other side of the rock face, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and I'm going to stand up to demonstrate this for you, Brent. But and the listeners won't be able to understand this, but oh, you will. Oh, listeners, let uh, me tell you. So, this, this is a man so, doing a podcast with no pants. Not only, on not only do Hang they on, like, I want to get comfortable for this. Go ahead. So you Lauren. play this game standing up, but not only does it necessitate you to like look around a corner, but oftentimes you'll have to like shuffle down a little ledge to get to where you need to be to reach the next handhold. Yeah. But because you have the headset on, you can't actually see. You have this feeling of nervousness that you're going to run into something or something is going to happen. Right. And they leverage that in the game and it is col- it is so compelling because you're physically moving around your play space. I play this game standing up and moving around and I play it with the controller. I do not believe this game would be any better with touch controllers by the way. Like like hand track controllers. The game the game is wouldn't, wouldn't fucking anything for you. It's br- no, it's brilliant and it's compelling in a way I can't even explain to you when you get to the top of a climb, it is amazingly satisfying. Each climb takes anywhere from like 18 to 27 minutes, so it's it's like a little bit of a trek to get up. I've only played easy so far. Right. I don't even know what medium and hard are like. And um, you have to duck to get under overhangs. And I mean, it's it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, that was one that I remember us talking about, and I, I really thought that looked cool. I have always kind of been interested in rock climbing. Um, even though I'm, I'm somewhat of a liability <laughs> where gravity is concerned, but, um, I've always really, really, uh, been enthusiastic about rock climbing. And to me, like that was a real kind of like no brainer. Like I, I think about things like that. I think about things like, you know, like we've talked about scuba diving and, uh, and all these other, all these other things that really benefit from, again, the immersion that VR, uh, can offer. So that I'm, I'm happy to hear that that experience is every bit as good as we kind of imagined it was going to be. It's amazing, dude. And I will say, and, and I think, you know, I could go on li- about this for a long time and may- maybe um, you know, we'll talk about VR more. The next podcast we're going to do is going to be an uncharted postmortem. But um, I, I I looked at the launch lineup of this and I thought there's not a lot of games that seem compelling to me. And Kronos, by the way, is also jaw dropping and beautiful and amazing. Mm-hmm. Um I thought there's not a lot of games that are like in my wheelhouse, and then I got the Rift, and at first couple hours, I was like, "God, I don't know, is this really worth six hundred dollars?" And then I got into the games, and I bought some games, and I played some games, and and I have to tell you that, and then I played um, uh, um, big screen, and, and it, it's it has exceeded my expectations. Uh, it really, it, it is really, really compelling, and the fact that the shit that we're seeing is literally the first games on the first hardware is mind boggling because is, once people get a hold of this, this is the Atari of VR, which is, which is fucking mind boggling. The difference is, is we're, we, we're not going to take 30 years to go from Atari to PlayStation two. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? This is going to happen. Once people really get a hold of the game, these games and play them and get time to experience them. This shit is going to accelerate in the matter of two, three, four, five years. And, and, and especially with the acceleration rate of the, you know, the 14 nanometer chips or whatever. It's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's fucking incredible, dude. It is, it is absolutely incredible. I encourage everybody to go try it in the store and then to go try it a second time in the store. And if you have friends that have it or whatever, go over there, check out, I think the climb, I think far lands and the climb are the two demos they're doing in the stores. And I would assume that this is as of like the time of this recording, I would assume, uh, within a few months, once they actually are able to satisfy all the orders, uh, their pre-orders out through July and August that they'll they will open up 
regular retail sales and more demo stations and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's tr- it's truly amazing, buddy. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. I am I am waiting in the wings, I guess. I mean, I really thought that when it came down to it, um I was going to uh, like I was going to have like VR on day 1, but uh you know, the finances just aren't there right now. Like I'm going to have to I'm going to have to wait a little bit longer and save a little bit more money before I can uh, I can buy my way into it. And depending on how long that takes, uh I don't know. I mean, I'm I I, I definitely see a distinct experience between oculus and what i imagine playstation vr is going to be but i am interested in playstation vr and the fact that you know it does cost less to get into and that they do have you know all these games lined up I, i'm curious about that but i don't know like you know if i had the money like right now i'd have an oculus but if i'm not going to have the money until like this christmas then i don't know like it does become a little bit of a, of a more interesting question but um well at the point of christmas you will have the touch controllers mm-hmm. Um, and I, and hopefully you would, I, you know, what I'm really concerned about with the PSVR is being lower spec. What's the impact? I, I, I can't really quantify in my head how much lower spec it is. Right. Um, in terms or what the real applications, I, you know, if they, as long as they have the, if the head tracking and the persistence and all that, that's, that's good. The resolution is going to be lower. I don't know how meaningful that is going to be or not. I'll tell you that most, like the fact that it's not as high resolution as uh, like the IR ideal would be. Um, is, is something that I don't think about ever when I'm actually playing the game. The the place where it really bugs me is when I sit down to watch a TV show or a movie. That doesn't have the quality of my HD TV, yeah. and that's the challenging thing. But I'll, I'll be dead honest with you. The thing that's most challenging for me when watching a TV or a movie is that I want to like put my legs on the ottoman because I see an ottoman on in front of me in the virtual world. But I'm sitting at my desk, and it's really, it's really uh, a disconnect. Uh, but time to bring in a cardboard box and a pillow. I think I'm going to have to. Yep. I think I'm going to have to. Well, guys, uh, I think that we are going to leave it there for uh, for this episode. But uh, it was great to be back uh, with you, Lauren, and great to be back with all of you uh, listening to us. And and we appreciate all of you that uh, have been uh, have been contributing to the website and keeping the Outlaw Gamer community alive uh, while the show has uh, has been on hiatus these past few months. Uh, I do think that we're going to have a bit uh, a bit more of a busy season as we uh, get into the summer here with Uncharted, and then of course E three coverage, and you know we'll see if we're playing uh, you know any uh, any similar games after that that uh, that might warrant some discussion, and of course as we get more into VR and all of the experiences that that has to offer, I'm sure that we'll be want to talk uh, we'll be wanting to talk about that as well. For right now, though, uh, I want to uh, just to invite all of you to uh, sound off in the comments and let us know what you think about the discussion today and everything that we've talked about. If you've got anything you want to say about the division, if you've been watching the live streams or playing in the live streams and, uh, and you want to talk about that, of course, we want to hear your thoughts there. And we definitely want to hear your thoughts. If you are like uh, Lauren or, or Fabian or any of the other outlaws that uh, have got VR right now and what your impressions are, what your favorite applications and games are, and what you think about the landscape of VR going into the bottom half of the year and where it's going from here. Uh, We'd like to uh, know what you think about all of that. So uh, with that having been said, I'll turn it over to Lauren for the out. Thank you uh, again for joining us. And thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Brent. It's always a good time to be here. I'm excited for uh, the gaming season that we have ahead of us. We, uh, as you said, we'll be doing an Uncharted postmortem soon enough, which makes me excited because that means we're going to be playing playing Uncharted 4. Uncharted 4 (laughs) soon enough. And, and God damn it, I hope on the heels of that we're talking about Red Dead Redemption. Me but uh, again, thank you guys for listening. We will be back in a couple of weeks as usual. He's Brent Adams. I'm Lauren Baumgart. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs> <laughs>